Jesus has compassion for his sheep. He knows his sheep. Isn't it wonderful to know that Jesus is aware of who you are and what you're going through? When I think of my family's 40-year uh, stint in Indiana, I'm so thankful he left us there because he knew us. And actually leaving us there was an act of compassion on his part. And as I think of all what we're going through in the sicknesses for what uh, Mike Stark is going through, Sharon is going through, what my wife and daughter are going through, God knows their hearts. He knows their every moment, every time they cough, and every time they get up and grunt because they want to do something and just to get out of bed. He knows them. And he understands what they're going through. As I reminisce uh, the previous messages we had on Psalm 23, I wondered how that applied to Jesus and the sheep of the New Testament. Therefore, as I looked at Matthew 9, we get a picture of Israel's shepherd, Jesus, healing various people while teaching concerning the kingdom. And our text is going to be just one verse, Matthew 9, 36. And we continue to see Jesus healing, in teaching, but the truth I want to focus on is Jesus' compassion that he knows the people of Israel, the sheep for whom he came. There are three words that Matthew uses which describes this. So if you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9, and we'll just read verse 36. And seeing the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much again for your grace, your goodness, that we have you as our shepherd. And the world doesn't know you. They don't, they don't understand what you're like, but we do. Thank you so much for your grace and for this moment that we can share together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first word found is in verse thirty. First word found in verse thirty-six is the word compassion, and the Greek word here stands for an overwhelming emotion. What's happening here is that Israel's true shepherd is moved with compassion in such a heartbreaking way that his heart just grips him. He looks at them with compassion. His heart just grips him. He sees their physical and spiritual condition, and his emotions swell up within him. It's like seeing something that really compels you. And we all have seen things that really compels us. What compels me is really seeing kids. I just love kids. This also happened later in Jesus' ministry as he approached Jerusalem in Matthew 23, 37. And we're probably all familiar with this passage also. Where he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent you, how often I have, again, longed to gather you, to gather your children together as a hand gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. It is an amazing the imagery God uses of sheep and of chickens, of hens, to teach us, to show us, to give us an image and a picture of how much he loves us, how deeply he is committed to us. The same love is referred to in Jeremiah 31.3, which says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Isn't that amazing? From the Old Testament all the way up through here, Jesus is continuing to love Israel, his people, and continue his faithfulness to them. The second word I'd like to focus on is really the first word that describes the crowds. The Greek word here is best translated harassed and distressed. Jesus here is aware of their condition and their situation. What we need to know is that the crowds were primarily farmers, peasants, and the poor of Israel. Historically, it is said that the average Jew was a farmer holding a small plot of land. And typically, the Jewish citizens did not own very much. They were, they were all basically poor. 
But what you see here before the destruction of Jerusalem is that even the average citizen that didn't have much looked down upon the very bottom, the very poor. That's why there were so many poor with cups, alms, looking for alms. Everyone looked down on the poor, the very poor, even the poor. After the destruction, you don't see this happening anymore in history. You see Israel taking care of everyone. It's so exciting that God had to literally take the religious system and destroy it for them to have compassion on their own people. Even women in these crowds were numerous, along with their children, because they were of low status. At this time in their history, Israel leadership manipulated the social order so that there were two primary classes, the wealthy and the poor. And the upper tier dehumanized the poor. They wanted to keep their position. And the Roman taxes didn't help. And you wonder why Jesus had to go into the temple twice with whips to get the money changers because there again they were stealing from the poor with their temple taxes. The religious leaders flaunted their religiosity and the others created difficult working conditions as they worked, as they employed those of the crowds. The crowds Jesus saw were harassed and oppressed, longing for something better. They were like us today, seeking a life that satisfies. They were not getting it from their poverty, nor were they getting satisfaction from the one thing that they should have gotten it from, and that was their religion, their relationship with God. So, in the light of that, what does she do when they're harassed? They flee. It's not like today where a person can jump in his car and just go for a ride, take a vacation, move to another city, find another job, or go to their camp, go fishing and hunting. They didn't have those luxuries back then. They flocked to Jesus. He went to the only person that cared. How many times have people come to you for some type of help because they knew you cared? That's what they were like. They were looking for someone who cared. The late Robin Williams said it like this, everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. Be kind, always. Why was life not offering anything that was truly satisfying to them? Why? Because they were looking for a quick fix, not life change. <clears throat> Let me ask you, what do you do when you can't find satisfaction in the world that's pressuring you? The world of sin that wants to mold you into the image that does not resemble Jesus. It just wants to mold you to pressure you. What do you do under that pressure? Picture this. This is kind of a weird picture, but it came to my mind and I had to, I had to laugh, so I'm going to share it with you. When I eat a grape, you know what happens sometimes? The juice just kicks back into your throat and you go, <clears throat> you're just trying to deal with it. Well, if you take a grape and you pinch it, what happens? The insides come out. Well, that's what happens with pressure. When you're pressured in life, how can I say your inside, your heart is revealed? What is your heart saying? What is it longing for in the midst of your pressures? Well. Israel revealed that. They really didn't want their shepherd. They wanted relief. They wanted the one thing that they thought was a quick fix. Satan and his and this world hate Jesus, but they really have nothing to offer. So when you think of the mold that he is trying to put you in, he has really nothing to offer you. Paul says in Romans 12, don't be conformed to this world. Don't let the world pressure you in your life and turn you turn life into where you're defeated and you feel helpless and hopeless. One where nothing satisfies. Unlike the sheep of Israel, we have a personal relationship with the shepherd. 
But I would still like to ask you, what pressure do you today? Is it as if your soul or your inside, your heart is searching for something more? A friend of mine uh, down in Indiana was working on his car. And I went over to visit him. I didn't know he was really struggling all that much, but he looked up at me while he was working on the lights and said, I hate my life. I literally hate my life. And he started talking to me and telling me what was going on. <clears throat> he had two jobs. And he found those jobs satisfying. The first job, I, I can't even remember what the first job was, but the second job, he was a coach. But in both those jobs, he was highly successful. And in being highly successful, the people above him gave that position to someone else and let him go. Twice. He found something in life that satisfied, something that he could enjoy, something that he could be a part, that he found uh, meaning, and it was taken away from him. He knows that God is teaching him to find a satisfaction in him alone. Sometimes it's hard. But in those times, we really have to look at our hearts and say, Lord, what are you trying to teach me? Yes, Jesus looked at the crowds. He deeply understood what they were going through. He was 32, 33 years of age at this time and spent many hours observing the social system. He was at the temple many times. He saw what was going on. He was fully aware of the social dysfunction. Even as you look at verse 4 of there, of the chapter 9, it tells you that Jesus perceived the thoughts of the scribes. He understood what they were thinking. It's amazing. He was not disconnected. And he's not disconnected from you either. All that you're going through, all your pressures, he's not disconnected. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're going through. When Jesus looked at the crowd and he had compassion, what do you feel he was saying inside? <clears throat> what, do you feel, what do you feel he was thinking? When you're going through pressure in your life, what do you feel that Jesus is, is thinking about you? I believe he was saying, if they would only truly come to me, only I satisfy. 1 John 4.10 says, in, his love, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. What does the word propitiation stand for? Satisfaction. His sacrifice on our behalf own for, for our sins forever. Therefore, when we placed our faith in Jesus for our forgiveness of our sins, he sets us free. We are free. My own problems with this is this guy. I hear an echo. I don't know. Maybe it's me. But he sets us free. He's our satisfaction. We are free from living to please people now to serve him. We are free to work hard because now we are pleasing Him and Him alone, not our employers. He is our satisfaction. We didn't earn salvation. It was given to us. Now we have freedom from the pressures of this world to serve Him because we have a personal relationship with the shepherd who alone satisfies our every longing. We, can, we no longer have to work hard in this world to find satisfaction. Because we have a satisfaction that can swell up inside of us more and more as we learn to love the shepherd more and more. That's what it's all about. You know what God wants more than anything? And this is the same thing that uh, Jesus was asked, telling him. You know what God wants more than anything? He wants to be with you. He wants to be with you. That you desire him as much as he desires you. When we realize this and seek it, inside you develops an overwhelming sense of peace, sense of purpose, genuine love for others. A life, life becomes satisfying. It becomes fulfilling. The second uh, word I'd like to look at in the verse uh, 36, and the Greek word has the meaning of downcast and weary. Some translations have it switched, but at least we have the words. When you see, what you see here is a progression in Jesus' thinking. He's not only just seeing them as being harassed and distressed. 
he is seeing them as being he is seeing them as being weary, downcast. They are downcast emotionally, spiritually. They are exhausted. They were they were used by their society and defeated. They had no one to turn to, no place to run, no hope. Another friend of mine in uh, Indiana, he was a maintenance worker. And if you needed something fixed on your machine, you called this guy. I'm glad he was put in our side of the plant. I mean, this guy was just amazing to fix anything. Well, he was asked to build this one machine, just a prototype so it could be presented to upper management so that the company could spend money on buying more of that one type of machine. He spent months working on that machine. And he got it finished, it worked well, he, he showed it to his management, who showed it to their management, but gave him no credit. Nothing at all, his name wasn't even mentioned. When I saw him, he was about in tears, he was broken. He really was broken. See, he wasn't a believer, he had no one to go to. Absolutely no one to go to. He felt used and defeated. He talked with me and shared his heart. The crowds did the only thing they could do. As mentioned before, they flocked to Jesus. They flocked after him so much that Mark 3, 7 and 8 says this, Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples, and a large multitude from Galilee followed him and from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and from beyond the Jordan, and from the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. When you take all these locations and you put them together, you're looking at an area of approximately 12,000 miles. Can you imagine that? No wonder you hear the Pharisees saying, the whole world is after him. Yeah, they are, because he's the only one that cared. They saw the miracles and were amazed. Thousands were healed. Yet they missed the significance of the miracles as Jesus taught them about himself. They viewed him as the, as the one to free them from the Romans, to free them from the oppression, to give them a quick fix. Instead, he came to be their hope spiritually, to set their hearts free. Because when your heart is set free, you're truly free, aren't you? But their focus was on their immediate needs and not what Jesus had to offer. Did that stop Jesus from loving and caring for them? No. Because love is sacrifice. Love is unconditional. A person in our budget meeting looked at the numbers from last year and what God has done in years past to try to come up with a budget and said, I don't understand how we as a church are so blessed. We always seem to have enough, more than enough. And I started thinking about that. And to answer that question, just look at that wall over there and all the missionaries we serve. Look at the impact this church is daily having because we have Jesus' compassion for the lost world. In Pekanjikum, and I found this unique, the Mission, Missionary of the Week was also going to be part of my message. In Pekanjikum, the people are literally dying because they have no hope. Colleen Estes gives them unconditional love. She fat sacrifices daily for them. And look at the McGee family. Again, a family that we as a church supported, but not only just in financially and in prayers, we had a group that went there and helped them work on their camp to build things for them. And now they're discipling, ministering, and we have a part of that. That's why God is blessing this church so much. Because we have Jesus' eyes, we have his compassion. And because of that, in our prayers, I, I envision it like this. Okay, I'm kind of different. Okay, I envision it kind of like this. A lighthouse. I love lighthouses. Okay, the base of the lighthouse, that's Jesus. He's the foundation, okay? 
We're the structure through our prayers and our supports. We uphold the light on top, which is Colleen Nessus. We uphold the light on top, which is the McGee's. That's why we're such blessed as a church. And I also want you to think of the number of people and families here at the church that uh, help in Feed America. People will literally wait in their cars for hours just to get a few bags of food. What is that saying? What is that telling us? They're looking for hope. Relief in the world that is more and more not valuing them. But we value them here as a body, and so does the Lord. That's why we're so blessed. What is the remedy for all this? For us as believers, it's Jesus Christ. When we think of tired and weary people, the veterans come to mind when I see them on TV commercials where they're wounded warrior projects, where they're looking for hope and looking for uh, help to be valued again. I like the way our hope in this world was mentioned by Chaplain Lieutenant Kerry Cash during, opera during Operation Iraqi Freedom as he ministered to his battalion of frontline combat Marines. In his memoir, hope I said that right, A Table in the Presence, which is talking about Psalms 23, our prayers were simple, he wrote that they were exactly what we all needed. We prayed for protection, for courage, for victory, for faith in di difficult moments, for assurance that we were not alone, for help in making tough decisions, for grace to endure and strength to overcome. We relied on the power of the Psalms, the will of God, the teachings of Jesus, the promises of eternal life. We clung to hope trusting in God's love, and belief in a divine purpose and a divine plan behind it all. Doesn't that also apply to us so significantly as we endure the pressures of life and find our values in Jesus? Doesn't that just apply to us? In conclusion, we find here that the crowds could have had their hopes answered because their, sh their shepherd was there in person offering them that hope. But the vast majority refused it. They could have been whole, valued, and lived the life satisfied, but most of them refused the shepherd's offer of salvation. Even being defeated as they were, they refused to look inside as they listened to Jesus. He saw their con condition. He offered himself for three years their hearts were still far from him. And he longed for them so much, even after those three years, his heart was with them. What did they, in effect, do? I found, I found this kind of tragic. As the poor were ill-treated by the wealthy, how did the crowds treat Jesus? The poor were used and defeated. What was Jesus? What did the crowds do to him? They used him. He provided food. He took the food. He provided healing. He took the healing for illnesses and for uh, their legs and whatever needed to be healed. And then what did they do? They went home. They went home. And where were they at the time of the crucifixion? They weren't there. They used them, just like they were being used. It's an amazing picture of the depravity of the heart. But we have a Savior at the same time he was being used, was still there, loving and caring, just like he's there in our lives, still loving and caring for us on days when we're pressured and we tend to put him on the side shelf. He loves us so much. He wants a relationship with us. For the rest of us who personally know Jesus, love him more and more. Draw closer to him. Learn what it is to have oneness with the Lord Jesus, to be one with Him. That's what He wants. He loves you and desires to be close to you. Let Him get closer and draw closer to Him. Only in Him do we find our value and satisfaction. And let us continue, again, like the verses 37 and 38 talk about, 
going out into the harvest and watch God continue to bless this church. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much that, Lord, your compassions toward, towards us are just so overwhelming. We just don't understand the heights, the depth, the breadth of your love towards us. It's amazing. And I can just sit back and say, wow. Lord, you're so great. Thank you for this passage that despite the pressures of life, you are there. You beckon to us. You say, come to me, only I satisfy. And truly, may this week, as uh, those that are still sick find wholeness and healing in you as they get better, may truly you be glorified. And may, as we go through the pressures of this week, may we glorify you and draw closer to you in everything and in every way. We ask in the name of Jesus.